I am Olaf Kristin Sigurðardóttir, the director of the Reykjavík Art Museum. The Reykjavík Art Museum um, operates in three locations in the city of Reykjavík. We are a um, collection-based museum and we have um, a collection of about 17,000 works, mostly Icelandic works since 1973. Our, our foc the focus in our collection is uh, more contemporary. Our locations uh, reveal a certain emphasis in our collection. Uh, at the moment we are in Karvalstaðir, uh, which is a pavilion in, the, in a park in the center of Reykjavík. Karvalstaðir is uh, dedicated to Johan Sveinsson Karval, who is uh, one of our, the pioneers of Icelandic art. His work is always on display here. In the coming year, we will be exhibiting his, his work in connection with, or in, co in conversation with works by contemporary artists. And that is a kind of a, an emphasis we will be, we will be giving uh, in, the, in the 2021, which is to, to put our collection in in uh, conversation with contemporary art. Both here in Karvalstaðir and in um, Ausmundarsab, which is one of the other two locations we have. Ausmundar Svensson, he was a modernist sculptor who, who studied in Sweden and was uh, a pioneer in Icelandic uh, sculpture. His work will be shown in, in, con in chosen by and in conversation with uh, leading Icelandic sculptures or, and uh, contemporary artists. Our third location is um, Hapnarhus, down by the harbour. There uh, we have uh, works by Erro, who is uh, one of the other three uh, pillars of our collection. His work is always on display there, but Hapnarhus is also our contemporary venue. We have uh, exhibitions of contemporary Icelandic artists there, as well as international um, contemporary artists. The Reykjavik Art Museum is an important venue for Icelandic art, for contemporary artists, for the Icelandic art scene, but it's also an important venue for uh, international art in Iceland. Our Exhibition policy is, um, is a combination of the strongest in, in our community and also to put, a, put the Icelandic art community in conversation with the international art community. The Icelandic art scene is quite strong, but it's also, and you know, it starts as a very isolated art scene, but you know, in the, in the times of globalization, it's easy to be uh, working internationally. Although you're living here, influencing this art scene, you can also be working internationally as, as very good examples show. But it's also important for the Icelandic community to be able to see their good and strong artists in, in, in conversation with international artists so that, that you, you experience what is well done in Iceland in, in, uh, and can compare it with what is well done internationally. We have a very strong connection with the community in Reykjavik. We, I mean, we, we have three different locations, so we can, we can show a lot of different art. We can talk to very different uh, different uh, communities at the same time. We're not talking to everyone at the same time, but we, we, can, uh, we have the opportunity to exhibit works, very different works in the different locations. So we have a very broad audience base. This exhibition is uh, frequented by, our, in a normal year, in, by about 220,000 people every year. It's not only for our exhibitions, it's also for different venues we host. We are, for example, good collaborators with Iceland Airwaves, which is a music festival in Reykjavik, and their main location is, uh, in, is in our downtown harbour-based uh, location. So all kinds of events and collaborations like that are very important for the museum. So we are, although we are a collection-based 
research, seriously researched, uh, oriented ex uh, exhibition venue, we also want to be a venue where people want to spend time, want to uh, enjoy the company of each other. And I think it's worked quite well for us in the, in the, in the past years. We have a very strong uh, outreach program, both uh, in regards to collaborating with the schools in Reykjavik, but also we are opening our uh, doors and our venues for the growing population of uh, new Icelanders coming from abroad to speak in different languages. So we are we are working on that, which is which is kind of new in the in the in the Reykjavik museums. Although that I fully realize that this is something that uh, the rest of Europe has been working on and and the U.S. for for many many years. Iceland is a has a very homogeneous uh, or, or background. So the community here has been changing quite a lot in the last years. And probably it has been a challenge, but it's also, it has made our community much richer. And we are really um, trying to adapt. It is important for the museum to be a venue for professional discussion and for, uh, to be a, a kind of anything for the for the art scene here both uh, for creative people and also for analyzing people for people from the theoretical uh, world so we have collaborated with uh, the art academy and the center for icelandic art on uh, international projects where we bring in um, people from the international uh, art scene, both curators and theorists and people from the university, university surroundings, to um, create a platform for discussion. And this is also an important part of our work. It's important to be a venue for creative people and for theorists in the community. The works that surround us here are by um, an Icelandic artist, Sigurður Árni Sigurðsson. And his exhibition is a part of the museum's program of uh, mid-career exhibitions, where we um, choose one per year, one Icelandic, leading Icelandic artist in the, in the midst of his career, and um, go through his, his work and make a publication and our our aim for this is to give examples of good uh, artists who are working in this community and you know each of them it is an example for many others the art scene in this country is very strong we have you can say that it's easy to have a, have a contemporary art museum because you have such a great group of excellent artists to, to work with. So we choose the artist for the mid-career retrospect so that in the end we will have um, good examples of different approaches and different uh, themes and, and uh, mediums uh, in the publications that follow the, these exhibitions. In Hapnerhus, in our downtown Harper location, it is important to, for us to be an um, experimental venue. We want to present uh, artists that are, are, are younger and risk-taking. Risk we also have there a space we call the D Gallery, where we want to present the, the youngest of the art scene in Reykjavik. And in Ausmundasab, the focus is on sculpture and three-dimensional works. The strengths of the Icelandic art scene are, you know, we have well-educated artists uh, who many of them seek their um, postgraduate or the, the graduate degree abroad in different countries, which brings to this country influence from many different places. 
and I think that's quite important. Uh, it's also, we have this islanders mentality, so that we don't really think that we are the center of the universe. We always have to go somewhere else to, to get the important influence. And I, that mentality is important because we bring to here, we're curious and bring to here influence from, from abroad, which is important in, in the globalist world to be able to, to talk to, international, to the international art scene. But it's also important to be proud of your roots. And I think they mostly are. You know, sometimes it's said to be uh, positive, but also sometimes negative because we are, we have um, a mentality of uh, working fast, maybe not preparing things in a long time in advance, but being able to execute things very fast. We are a very small community. We have to carry many hats. We have to, to deal with different things in a, in a very fast. And it works for, for Icelandic artists. It benefits them. They don't really, I think they more look at possibilities than obstacles. And it's also, it's not only for the creative part of um, exhibiting and creating art, it's also for us here in the museum. We sometimes have to work very fast because, I mean, we have many hats. In the last years, um, I think the community of Icelandic artists has, uh, has strengthened in the way of being um, a community of collaboration, where people work together, where people support each other, where people have strong role models that have succeeded in a very uh, successful way and see that you know, being a part of a, of a community is much better than being a, part, being a, a soloist. A landscape was the drive in the beginning, and I think it still is. It maybe has a different um, aim, because at the moment, sustainability and global warming is a big issue. And for Icelandic artists, it's a, it's, it's a topic that really is realizing in front of you. We have the, the vanishing glaciers, and they're just reality in front, of, in front of people living in Iceland. So it's not a, a far-reached theme to, to, talk, to talk about. So it's, I think Icelandic artists are many talking about nature and landscape but they're not doing it in the same way as their um, predecessors. You find this um, topic uh, amongst the ones that Icelandic artists are dealing with, but also international artists are interested in Iceland in regards to our nature and, how, and what our na nature is revealing about what's going on in the world. You can mention artists like, I mean, Olaf Eliasson, He's an internationally well-known artist who has used Iceland as a as a as a material for for many many years. Yeah. Ronnie Horn has has um, sought inspiration in this in this country and it's both its history and nature. So it's it's quite normal that nature is a big is a big uh, theme or a big discussion in, in Icelandic art and art that's related to this country. The Reykjavik Art Museum um, is responsible for public art in Reykjavik. I mean, we have maybe uh, around 180 works in this small town, which is quite, quite well done, I think. And we are, you know, art here is developing as public art is developing internationally. Um, so it's interesting to walk around the city and enjoy the different works. Um, we're also proud of um, works by internationally well-known artists that are a part of the city. And um, there I can mention Claudio Parmigiani, um, Richard Serra, and then we have a work, in, uh, the Imagine Peace Tower by Yoko Ono, who in the island of Vide, just outside of the city. 
which is um, an important piece for the city and it's also an important piece for the world to commemorate John Lennon and, their, and Yoko Ono's wish for peace. And Yoko Ono uh, has been um, quite, we've exhibited her work in, in, um, in the museum and enjoyed working with her. And it sets, a, it makes a special atmosphere in the city uh, in the time period when it's lit in, um, in November and October, November and December in, in every year. I think the art scene in Reykjavik has opened up in the last years. It's maybe a part of an international trend that museums and exhibition venues are quite popular. They're well frequented. And um, the idea of uh, being approachable is something that we cherish and uh, want to be able to talk to different audiences in an um, easy way. We want to be approachable. We still want to be um, doing cutting edge exhibitions. We want to challenge people. We want to challenge the audience. But we are prepared for the conversation. I mean, it's internationally, um, museums have been developing in this way. We are, I mean, we don't want to be um, the quiet place where only really well-educated people can enjoy themselves. We want to be able to, to present difficult issues, but work with them in a way that is enjoyable, comprehensible, challenging for all kinds of people. So this has been, this has been uh, changing a lot in the last years in, or in the last decades in both here and elsewhere. And um, this museum has in many ways been able to develop its educational programs and its outreach programs and conversations with artists in a way that has benefited a lot of people. And our programs are really well um, attended. So we are happy with the situation we're in. It doesn't mean that we don't want to develop, we don't want to take new steps. And the, the idea of being challenging is very important for us. We put up exhibitions that are kind of blockbuster exhibitions. But it's also very important to work with artists that make, that are presenting works that are challenging. Not so many people want to see maybe, but are still important and take steps in the history and development of art. The exhibition we have at the moment by, uh, of works by Caraval is uh, called At Home. The, pr the previous one was uh, um, in, uh, from abroad. So we are kind of working with the idea of the influence he, he brings to Iceland from abroad. But in this exhibition, he's guiding us through Iceland, through how he sees nature in Iceland, which was a big, big theme in his work. Erro is well known for his um, for how he uses um, images already existing in the world and combines um, different parts, different ideas in one work. And at the moment we have an exhibition called Cyborg, where the curator is presenting works by Arrow where he is combining human and machines. Karvalstaðir is um, one of the most beautiful buildings in Reykjavik. It's a modernist building designed by an Icelandic architect, Hannes Kaur Davison. Um, it's a pavilion-like structure in a beautiful park in the city. And it has this atmosphere of being inside, outside, enjoying the, the nature around the building from within. The D Gallery series started in 2007 and it's where emerging artists who have put their mark on the Icelandic art scene 
uh, exhibit. They exhibit in this gallery and uh, it's the first exhibition for these artists at a public museum. And it's also a great opportunity for us at the museum to get to know these artists and to get to know the grassroots and what's happening in the art scene. First, we always chose the exhibitors, but for the last couple of years, we have made an open call, which has been very rewarding because uh, it's been, I think last, last time we got 130 applications and we go over them all like an exhibition uh, committee and it's just such a wonderful opportunity for us to get to know what's happening within the scene and often the artists that are picked to show at the gallery series uh, are artists that are might be known within the art scene but are not necessarily known to the general public so it's an opportunity for our guests the general public Icelandic and foreign to get to know these artists as well. It can be valuable for artists to uh, get the experience to work at the public museums. There they work with a curator, they work with a technical team and the, the marketing department and so just uh, learning how to work within a professional museum environment. Uh, I think it could be very valuable for artists that are starting and, you know, stepping their first steps. I've been very fortunate to uh, get the opportunity to work with several artists uh, in this exhibition series. And the next one I will be working on is the 43rd exhibition, and it's Auður Lóa Guðnadóttir. We have had several meetings uh, discussing the themes of the exhibition and what she will be doing. She works a lot with sculpture and uh, where she gets her um, inspiration from everyday life, the internet, often funny peculiar things and art history and, and it's a very exciting exhibition. It's on its way. So uh, my exhibition is uh, of various sculptures that I am in the process of making. Uh, I work mainly figuratively uh, using papier mache and uh, I, my mind has been kind of all over the place and Altis has had uh, probably a hard job of keeping up with all the ideas that are kind of flowing around, uh, around this exhibition. Um, I'm working a lot with uh, found motifs, uh, pictures from the internet, uh, from popular culture and from history and, as Alti said, art history. Um, and so I'm kind of piling together a lot of different motifs and trying to make, an, uh, hopefully, an interesting narrative uh, for museum guests to see. Getting this opportunity to have this exhibition in the Reykjavik Art Museum is very valuable to me and uh, I think I would be speaking for a lot of emerging artists uh, that this is a fantastic opportunity to uh, make an exhibition on this scale and uh, to be able to show it in uh, this uh, public space. I did my BA at the Iceland University of the Arts and uh, I graduated in 2015 and I've been working independently since then. And what's great about working within the Icelandic art scene, uh, which is also maybe sort of a problem, is that you make your own opportunities. And so I've been doing a lot of curating as well and um, making actually exhibitions uh, and uh, exhibiting in various different uh, galleries and uh, exhibition spaces in Reykjavik. The uh, community of artists in Iceland is very close-knit, I would say, and uh, maybe we all live in sort of an artist bubble here. The exhibitions at the D Gallery are also a great opportunity for us curators to curate our first exhibitions within the museum, and it's always a great pleasure to be involved in them.
My name is Sirra Sigrún Sigurðardóttir. I'm a visual artist based in Reykjavík. I have an exhibition coming up um, uh, late winter, early spring in Ásmundar Svensson Museum, which is part of the Reykjavík Art Museum. Yeah, it's, it's opening in uh, probably in February or March. Uh, in this uh, very special building that uh, Ausmundersab is. He designed it and built it himself. And the space that I'm working with is a um, building that he uh, built as his studio. And it's very unusual. It's like an, uh, it goes in a, in a curve. So it's all no straight lines and it's a pretty complex space to work in, but beautiful. It's, a, it's special, it's, it's made by an artist for his art, both to, to create it and to exhibit in. So it, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, it's filled up with light, but, uh, but the shape is, is very unusual. I'm working on... Um, using the building as a sort of like an instrument that creates my work. Uh, and Ausmunder was, um, he was, he was quite a unique artist in that way. He was very fluent. He, he, he was highly educated, uh, but during his career he was always uh, changing his style and changing the materials that he was using. And for me, I'm mostly drawn to the uh, sculptures he was making like in the 60s and 70s that are like, uh, they're like mathematical and, and very, um, you know, highly modern, uh, quite simple sculptures. But he was um, very enthusiastic about science and technology and things like that, which uh, we both have sort of in, in common. So part of the exhibition is that I will choose works by him to put in context with my work. So that's this dialogue between, between me and Ausmunder. Yeah, it's all sort of... Um, coming together from different directions. I started out by like uh, refreshing my memory and going back to, to look at Ausmunder's uh, uh, career and just his personal history and, and, and his work, of course. And, and then uh, choosing like a few works that I, I want to focus on, uh, but then uh, because I'm used to working quite site-specific. Uh, I work uh, not exactly installations, but always taking into account the space you're working with. And, and this very, very special space that Ausmundersab is, uh, so that you, you have to either ignore it or, or really embrace it. So, so now I'm working on uh, using, using the, how, how the, the shape of the building and, and corresponds with um, the seasons and, and how the sun evolves around it. And so I'm, I'm sort of like calculating to turn it into some kind of a, a sundial that interacts with the, with the space inside. Asmunder is born like late 1800 and uh, he's, a, he's a son of a farmer on the west coast of Iceland. And I mean, there was hardly any art, there was no art in Iceland at that time, but um, and it was just expected of him to become a farmer, but he sort of knew that he would be a terrible farmer 
So he convinced his parents to let him go and to learn um, wood carving in Reykjavik. Uh, and then he's, he sort of developed from there to learn more, uh, more, more into like sculptural practice. And his teacher, Ricardo Jonsson, uh, encouraged him to, to go abroad to study. And he, he went to, to Denmark first, and, and then to Sweden, and to Paris. And he was highly educated and traveled around Europe, went to Italy and to Greece to, to study the classical art. And he got like a very classical education, but good education. And he, he started out like, you know, doing you know, very classical sculptures, sculptures of like naked, naked women. And, but, but soon after he, he finished school, he started to, to change into more like what we in our mind is like modern art, you know, to play around with the forms and, um, and found his own personal style. And I think he was very um, aware of what was happening in art elsewhere in the, in the world. You can, like, if you look at his uh, career, he's, he's, he's always He's always developing, always uh, uh, changing his style and, and very versatile in terms of materials. What makes him maybe a little bit uh, more Icelandic than his colleagues in other countries is like the, his choice of um, materials like concrete. He made these huge outdoor sculptures out of concrete. But he was always um, always uh, uh, doing something new and he was never like um, stuck in one place and also uh, which is kind of special about his career is that he during his career he built two houses as his studio and home so two times he took a few years off from making art just to focus on building these houses and he talks about it himself that he considers them to be sculptures and and talks about how how that fed into his art and he, he actually built them with his own hands so I think I think that's a, a, an important part of his his career. I think the connection between me and Ausendmünder as, as artists is like um, curiosity and also just like look, you know, he was very uh, interested in science and technology. Like you can, like when you look at his, uh, his work and, and you look at the, the date of the work, it, it's like he's, he's taking uh, subjects from like what is happening in the world. It is a, there is a little bit of, like a, of a political um, connection if you want, but it's like open for for interpretation. And this is this is kind of similar to the way I work myself. I like taking cues from science or politics or visual information about like all kinds of uh, data that is uh, in our time but somehow incorporating that in 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 the art it's just a, it's a um, opportunity to look back at, at his career and in and create some connection between uh, the present and the past and I, I think it's, um, it's very relevant, you know, there's like to, to use this, uh, his art as a springboard to create something new. My name is Ragnar Kjartansson and I'm an artist. There was a show in 2017 called uh, God I Feel So Bad in the Reykjavik Art Museum. And it was a, sort of an overview show or what do you call it, mid-career retrospective. And uh, 
which was great. Like some of these works were shown for the first time here in Iceland. And uh, I had, the year before I had done, uh, there was a sort of overview show at the Barbican in London and the Hirschhorn in Washington. And then it was great to, to show the stuff here and also showing, um, yeah, it was, a, it was not the same show, it was a different show. And uh, the curator was Markus Thor Andersson, who is a, is a curator at the Reykjavik Art Museum. And uh, it was a lot of fun working with him on the show because me and him were together in art school and he was very sort of instrumental in kind of creating the artist I became. <laughs> So he was sort of a, we all, I often joke about it that, you know, I was sort of a Eliza Doolittle and he was, in, what's his name, in My Fair Lady. <laughs> because he, st he started studying to be a curator and I was continuing with the art stuff and, and then, he, then we had all these conversations which sort of kind of made me realize what I was doing. And uh, then, you know, often when you realize what you're doing, you kind of become more focused in it. And, uh, and th so this show was almost like all, also almost like a culmination of our of our uh, collaboration or relationship, which was fantastic. And uh, also uh, me and uh, Markus and uh, his partner Dorothy Kirch worked together in 2008 in doing my exhibition at the Venice Biennale when I had the Icelandic Pavilion, where I was. Uh, painting my friend, the artist, Paul Hauke Björsson, for, for half a year in his pito. And we were uh, just drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and, you know, kind of spiraling deeper and deeper into the abyss. That was sort of the performance. And uh, it actually went as according to plan. It was really uh, um, sort of an amazing experience. And I think that experience came a lot from that was also a lot from, uh, from uh, me and Markus' uh, talks and collaboration about, you know, about the idea of paintings more as performance than, paint, than objects. Sort of the performative act of painting. Kind of taking it, you know, there's of course the, the famous performative act of painting of Jackson Pollock and then, and then also, but then also here in Iceland we have we also have this kind of, you know, all these kind of legend of painters, like, like here around us, there is like, there is Karval, who was kind of like him doing his paintings was such a performative act. It's like always kind of in a suit like this in, in nature and, uh, you know, took a taxi, you know, never had a car, always just took a taxi and the taxi driver drove him to some lava field and, and the taxi waited while he did the painting. It's just so performative and uh, that, that those stories and that uh, idea sort of also of the kind of the kind of this uh, this almost hilarious idea of the painter the macho painter became the work that was the end in Venice I cannot a lot to care about I'll be like, I'll be, I mean there is the I mean because there is this performative aspect I think of being an artist I mean it's not like you're playing a role. It's like, it's this ridiculous thing when you decide what I do matters and I'm an artist. It's almost just like a, it's almost this switch, which like, it's like so, there's something wrong with it, almost. <laughs> and, and therefore also like, there also persons like Carval were so extreme in it because you know, he was in a society where it was completely ridiculous to be an artist. So he just kind of played the role just to defend himself, I think. Became this kind of over-the-top artist. And, uh, and I always find it fascinating that like this, because the stories of him are, they're, they're pretty legendary always, the stories of him. Legendary in a very mundane way, you know. It's like him showing up at a funeral and drunk at a, like an old priest told me that Carval once showed up at the funeral while he was doing the speech. He just walked into the church and everybody was just like, wow, that's Carval. And he just walked straight to the coffin because he had been in the bar in Hotel Borg next to the church and would had like a glass of cognac and just like poured it over the coffin and walked out again. That's like pretty hardcore. <laughs> beautiful performative stuff. 
And there's like all these legends about him, which I f find, you know, find they somehow, they somehow enhance the works. I mean, the works really speak for themselves. I mean, a painting is a painting, but I think almost gr also growing up here in Iceland in this kind of culture of stories and storytelling. And uh, I wasn't until like in my mid thirties where I understood the idea of the art object. I was always kind of more fascinated, you know, I was just like, it was always about stories of artists, how they did it and how drunk they were when, when doing it, etc., etc. So, so I think, and I, like, that's how people talk about Kervali. We very, hear people very seldom talk about the, the works them, itself and like the format, you know, the, uh, the form or ideas behind it. It's just like, like when Karval was doing this, he was like that, ha ha ha, you know, and, uh, and I think that had a, that had a, you know, a big um, effect on me. I sort of, you know, like, okay, yeah, like when you take this decision that you're an artist, you just like, I mean, it, it is embarrassing to, to take the decision and just like, okay, I'm just gonna do it and be it. And it's, it's almost, it's not a role, you don't act like you're an artist, but you just like, you sort of step into this to this, you know, to this idea. Yeah, I think he has influenced, he has influenced kind of like everyone who's doing it. Carvalho is like this interesting, super local artist. Like he's this, like nobody knows Carvalho outside of Iceland. And, and he somehow kind of, I mean, I mean, the works are, you know, in, in art historic context, it's, you know, they're sort of 50 years too late, but uh, it's sort of like Edvard Munchian, but like, you know, painted at the time when Edvard Munch was dying. But uh, kind of the power of his character and, uh, and determination to just be an artist and kind of stand outside society, I think, that has really influenced the uh, idea of the art scene in Iceland or Reykjavik or because there's, there's this there's this really strong idea that the art scene sort of you know it, it exists for in art for art's sake and I find that very healthy and that that there's very little you know nobody does art to for for the sake of market and yeah, I mean, some people do, but very, but they are a laughing stock. <laughs> yeah, I think he sort of marked an area that like, like Carval is almost like, you know, it's like you have, to, you know, he sort of marked this area that you kind of have to be independent against, you know, kind of public opinion, against, you know, the, the rules of uh, bourgeois society. And, uh, and I think that had a huge influence on how the, how the art scene involved here. So I think his, his echo is totally in sort of everyone who's working in art today. Yeah, maybe, maybe the kind of more influential for me than Carval, I think, is this artist called Mukur, Gumdu Torstensson. He was like, he, he died in 1924 and was born, I think, in 1890 or something. But he died about 30, in his early 30s. and. I, you know, I visit his grave almost every morning, and this, he was this uh, kind of very genteel character. Also, kind of, he's very interesting, kind of, in in contrast to Carval and you know and Einar and Einar Jonsson and all these first generation artists. So there's this kind of macho energy, but there's a very kind of feminine energy from Mukur, and uh, and he probably was uh, he probably was gay, and he. He did. He was a painter, and he was, and he kind of wrote books, children, like the, one of the greatest children book in Iceland, called Dimalim. And he did uh, kind of textile works, sewing works, and he was an actor. So I remember, like, I remember in art school when I was, you know, being, you know, it was like you should, you know, try to focus, Ragnar. You know, you know, you have to, you cannot just double in everything. I always thought of Mukur, like, like actually Mukur doubled and everything. He's, he's pretty cool.
So he was really my role model, I would think. Yeah, he's an artist I very often, I almost just like, you know, I kind of have, have him as, you know, it's like you, you, you create your own guardian angel or something like that. He's, I sort of decided that Mukur was my guardian angel. I think he's just in his grave, doesn't care, but, but I kind of imagine that he's here with me. But then, of course, there's the, uh, there's the uh, kind of fierce uh, explosion in the, in the 60s, 70s that has, a very, that has had a huge effect on me and, you know, and kind of everyone. When Fluxus came to Iceland with, and, you know, and Dieter Roth came with Fluxus and sort of, but also just like somehow discovered his own art here in Iceland, like, like Dieter's art became chaotic and, uh, and about stories and about, and about uh, this kind of mayhem. It was very much, he found that here in Iceland. And uh, yeah, artists from that generation had, you know, have had a big effect on me, like, you know, performance artists like Ruri, her, her works, just like that, uh, that famous uh, work where she was a sculpture in a corner and stood up as a, then the sculpture stood up and, and, uh, and walked through the room. Just this very simple act of kind of, you know, kind of feminist statement that, that you know, oh, she, the, sub, the object becomes, you know, the, uh, the objectified becomes the, uh, the doer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was a really strong piece. Then uh, just, uh, I would say Birger Andrisson is also a huge influence. Like his, his works about identity and kind of how he deconstructed, like kind of also he deconstructed national identity that, you know, he played with the idea of like, you know, what is Icelandic and always when he was looking at something that's Icelandic, it's actually not. Like everything is always borrowed and remixed and, uh, and he was also a larger than life character. He, I think he was definitely influenced by Kerval. You know, he kind of, he almost drank himself to death for aesthetic reasons. And then there's just like this, the scene around me just that, uh, you know, my, my peers and uh, and of course, there's a huge influence in just like growing up in, as a teenager around the Sugar Cubes and Björk. Like that music scene had such a huge effect. And I think like having Björk in Reykjavik, you know, gave everybody so much confidence, you know, like you're doing something and you're like having some art show or a, or a concert and just like Björk shows up. It just like, poof, it's a confidence boost. And, and also like her, her attitude and her and her um, her gang, like the the bad taste gang, like their attitude to art and uh, this, this is, which is also this sort of outsider, you know, never surrender to com commercialism uh, attitude was very influential, and I think also for the art scene. So, you know, in general, she made such a huge page for for the artist and like. For what you like, and you know, to to have her as a role model, I think then you, that, which I think that's pretty good. Then it's like you know, there is no, there's no way you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna compromise if she's she's the role model. And I think she's a you know role model for a, I mean she's for me and for a lot of artists I think, and how she uh, kind of you know created her own turf also as a as this kind of avant-garde pop star slash filmmaker, visual artist. It's kind of, you know, sort of, sort of, she's, she's very much like Mukur, you know, that there is a very, that there is, you know, it's hard to define what she is, but she created that space very much. And uh, we that come after, we sort of play in it. I was working as an artist here in, in the Reykjavik scene, and, uh, and then suddenly, like, my, my works started, like, you know, being shown abroad and I was doing exhibitions abroad, but but I've always lived here and never never moved, you know, to, to New York or Berlin or something. Because the uh, I've always really liked the scene here. It's really you know, it's very kind of it's very you know, like uh, it's hardcore and vibrant and uh, 
and no and you know no compromise made and there's so much camaraderie there's like camaraderie with older artists with younger artists it's like there's very little uh, uh, there's so little you know jealousy here no rivalry or jealousy it's like it's a it's you know like uh, people just uh, support you in when you're striving and they support you when you're successful, both. Which I think is pretty powerful. And I like living here, I think, because also when you have role models like Björk, she's like, she's been living here, you're like, yeah, of course, you don't need to move away. Yeah, I just think it's, uh, it's, it gives so much energy to, to live in a scene, in an art scene that is uh, kind of anti-commercial. And like you, like I go abroad and work in the art world, and then when I come back here, like the art world, you know, it's not that important anymore. It's like a, it's just, it's like Costa del Sol. It's out there. It's nice. So, so therefore, also like my relationship to the big art world is just nice because I, it's not daunting. You know, I'm here, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't suck you up when you're sort of working in this scene. I mean, it is also, it is also like, it's crazy interesting to, to get older. And suddenly like, suddenly like I am now the age as Biggie Andrésar was when I was in art school. <laughs> and it's pretty interesting. Like, no, yeah, now you're like the, I know I'm the older generation. And I find, I just find what, uh, what, you know, younger and emerging artists are doing here is pretty, brilliant and pretty yeah inspiring and uh, you know, and it's, it's, I mean and the people are just kind of working across genres and uh, so that it's very hard to pinpoint you know what's happening you know like oh it's not like uh, there's a big it's just like kind of like Reykjavik scene now is a very post 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 it's just so I'm I'm just totally yeah, in awe of what people are doing, like younger artists are doing. And you, and it's constantly inspiring. It's like when you get older, you become like a vampire. <laughs> and like, <laughs> these works give me energy for my works. <laughs>